All right, let's talk about bird-based evaluation of text generation systems. Uh, in this talk, I will have four uh, four parts. The first in the fir the first part is I will talk about transformers on a very high level and without going into much details, but just to give you some background on transformers be because not all of you may be familiar with that. After that, I will talk about BERT. BERT is the most popular current uh, system in natural language processing, my field. Uh, it, is, it is crucially based on transformers and it has had, has had a super huge impact on the whole of the NLP community. And then after introducing both of these architectures on a high level and... Uh, and uh, uh, and without many details, I will go into our own work that is, is based upon BERT and that is doing evaluation of text generation systems and in particular of machine translation systems and summarization systems with the help of BERT. And we have two, uh, two modi operandi, so to speak, and these are reference-based and reference-free and I will explain both of these setups uh, when we come to the respective part in the talk. So let's talk about transformers and we want to talk about transformers. We may start out with uh, discussing again what recurrent neural networks are. As pictured here, you see a recurrent neural network with its typical ingredients. Uh, it has X inputs XI, it maps these inputs XI, which in our case, uh, in our community are typically vector representation of a word. So you have a word uh, which underlies this uh, XI and this word has been mapped to some vector using a embedding function and now we have we have this vector then this vector is mapped via a linear transformation matrix wx onto a hidden hidden state which is also a vector and from this hidden state we may derive a prediction or a label for the current input xi and importantly in recurrent neural networks we have this recurrent this recurrent connection which maps uh, the current hidden state um, uh, or which relates the current hidden state to the previous hidden state. We can enroll such a network in time. You see the, the illustration here, that's a RNN unrolled in time. And uh, when you do this unrolling, then you see, uh, you see the recurrent nature, namely that the current hidden state is related to the previous hidden state by a linear transformation. And, um, and uh, with this uh, recurrent connection, what, we all, what is the big advantage of that is that we can take all of the past into account uh, when we are at current time step t, right? Because you, you can just follow the, the arrows and you see that in this hidden state uh, is incorporated information from the previous hidden state and this previous hidden state depends on the previous input. So in this hidden state, in the current hidden state HT, we have information about X2, and we also have via this uh, uh, iterat iterative recurrent connection, we also have information about uh, X1. So really, in this hidden state, all of the information from all of the past is, in principle, uh, available. So that when we, we can make this decision here at time step t equal 3, we can take a lot of context into account. And this works at least in principle, right? This is a, a, a theoretical, uh, theoretical um, relationship, um, but in practice it has seen some limitations. And what are these limitations? So let's talk about the second one first, long pass, vanishing and exploding gradient. So what does that mean? So this basically means that um, this information here from time step one has to travel a long path until it may arrive uh, at uh, X3 here or H3 here. So uh, because it has to go, it has to travel along all of this path. And uh, now this path is not very long, but you may imagine that um, if we, the further we go back into the past, the longer the path becomes and this means that along this path a lot of information may be lost and this is also called the vanishing uh, the vanishing gradient problem namely that we lose information about the distant past 
And this means that in practice, these architectures were often not capable of taking very long history into account, despite their, uh, despite their theoretical properties of being able to do so. And there have been some solutions that could address this to some very uh, varying degree. One of them is the so-called long short-term memory neural network, LSDM. Uh, which is which was introduced in the 90s by Hochreiter and Schmidhuber and then uh, became extremely popular like only 10 to 15 years later and this could really address the vanishing and also the exploding gradient problems but um, also not perfect. And the other thing is uh, the other limitation of RNNs are the recurrent nature. So this recurrent nature connects a hidden state to the previous hidden state and this means that when we want to do computation for uh, for the current hidden state, we have to wait until all of the previous computations are finished. And this, of course, uh, makes parallelization very difficult, if not uh, like impossible. And transformers have been proposed to the rescue. Like they were proposed in a seminal paper by Vaswani, 2017, attention is all you need. And uh, the, their, ba their main uh, principles is that they are feedforward networks, so they have no recurrent connection, so they do not, do not have the problem of long paths. Uh, and also they can be parallelized because they have no recurrent connections. Uh, what they use importantly is the so-called self-attention mechanism. And uh, as I said, they have constant path lengths and no uh, recurrence. Let's look into some details. Um, and th this is based on uh, these two websites, which I can, uh, which I can, ha uh, which I can very much recommend to everyone interested in the topic because it's very nicely illustrated uh, and explained in a in a very uh, simple and uh, manner, which is uh, easy to understand for even for people who do not have too much background on this material. So the high level view of a transformer is that it is an encoder decoder architecture. So encoder decoders uh, like they also go back uh, in the neural context to the year 2013, 2014, where people have used encoder decoders for machine translation. So this is the basic setup. You have an input sentence, in this case, a French sentence, you translate it into an English sentence. Uh, you have an encoder in between that maps the input representation into a, into a vector and the decoder takes this vector and then from the vector generates the output. So this is the high level uh, setup of transformers, encoder, decoder. Uh, then we zoom in and we actually see that both the encoder and decoder consist of six layers, uh, six stacked layers um, of smaller encoders and smaller decoders. And the number six is a little bit arbitrary. Uh, this is um, uh, a hyperparameter that you could also fix to some other number. In the in the in their first paper, they they used six. Uh, um, okay, so we have these small encoder decoders. How do they look like? Uh, each of these encoders uh, basically consists of a self-attention layer and a feedforward neural network, right? So we, we have we have this setup. Um, what I will describe now is um, I will describe the self-attention layer and only the encoder because the decoder, well, it has some important modifications, but in in principle, it's more or less the same like the encoder. Um, yeah, so we describe the encoder and we describe the self-attention. So what is attention? So before describing att uh, self-attention, let's first describe attention. So. <coughs> <coughs> So the attention was the key to making neural machine translation work. So initially machine translation was proposed, but it did not have the attention mechanism. So what happened in, in classical um, encoded decoded neural networks was that the whole input was mapped on one global vector and then the, the decoder neural network had to decode from this whole global vector the output sentence. And you can imagine that this is not an easy task because, well, this, um, uh, this global vector would be a fixed size, but the input could be arbitrarily long. So in, uh, what you could imagine is that um, 
uh, that the, uh, this uh, global vector could not store all of the relevant information, right? Uh, and the other thing is also that um, uh, when a certain output element has to be produced, it typically does not depend on all of the input structure. So this global vector encodes all of the input structure or is supposed to encode all of the input structure, but any given output symbol does not depend on that. So the task is made difficult for uh, when producing any given output symbol because it, it sees so much irrelevant information, right? And what Badano instead proposed is instead of making a global vector uh, from which to decode the next output symbol. How about ch making a local vector? And this local vector uh, chooses some um, some input parts on which to focus. For example, let's take this example here. We want to produce our next output symbol yt, like in machine translation, we want to produce our next um, translated output token. This, of course, like <coughs> encoder decoder um, uh, in the in the in the classical paradigm was consisting of two RNNs. So we have a, an RNN as the as the decoder. It has its hidden state st, and this hidden state st uh, would be informed by some parts of the input, and uh, by which part it would be informed uh, is something that it it can decide itself. So it can set some attention weight which form a probability distribution alpha 1 to alpha t so t is the whole input and it can decide where do i want to uh, put my attention to so it could for example set alpha 1 to 0 alpha all of the alphas to 0 maybe except for these two alphas here alpha 2 and alpha 3 maybe it puts them to one half and one half and this would mean that when we want to produce this output uh, symbol here we would focus with the same attention on the inputs x2 and x3, right? This is what the model would learn by itself. And uh, thereby, uh, the model could say which local context to consider when producing an output. Now, this attention can be visualized. So after the model has been, has produced something, let's say it had, it had a French sentence as input, it produced an English sentence. We can then visualize the attention weights, and in this example here, and in this example here, we take we take some produced units like European. We check what are the attention weights in the in the pixels here. You see the darker it's the darker the value, um, the smaller the attention weight. So basically, it puts attention zero on everything except two words, and these two words are European and economic a little bit, but more European. And as you can see, if you have some basic understanding uh, of French and English, that this is exactly the right decision. Um, so it puts the right attention and you can see that most of that is on the diagonal. So most of the attention <coughs> is placed on the diagonal, which is uh, sensible because English and French are quite similar language. So we would expect a reasonable model to put most of the attention on the diagonal. And you can, you can ch see and uh, 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 visually uh, convince yourself that this, um, that this attention makes a lot of sense by uh, um, forcing the model or by uh, forcing the model to pay uh, to look into the right context for each uh, new output symbol to be produced. Now, the transformer model does not use attention, but instead it uses self-attention. Um, self-attention is similar uh, or is, is very similar to attention, except that the input and the output are not different, but the input and the output are the same. So we, we have twice the same sentence. The animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. The animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. Now we can learn our attention weights for each word. We can say, where does it pay attention to? In this case, the, uh, the word it placed the attention on the animal the most and uh, uh, less on, on other parts of the input text. So, uh, and these attention weights are learned by the model themselves. So what we could speculate what the model was doing here it is that maybe it was learning a little bit of co-reference resolution. So it would, it would learn that 
it and the animal are co-referring, which is very important for translation because ima imagine if you translate into German, then uh, you need to know whether the, the animal is masculine or feminine to produce the correct, uh, to c the correct translation of it, right? So it's doing something meaningful here. So this is basically the, uh, the, the transformer model. So um, it consists of encoders, it consists of decoders, uh, it takes an input, takes an output, has no recurrent connections, is entirely feed forward. It's using this uh, attention, which uh, where well, it uses these encoder blocks, uh, and each encoder blocks it has a self attention layer, then a feed forward network. Uh, this attention learns to uh, learns to connect the input with itself, then transforms that by a transforms it by a feed forward network. In the next layer, we again have the attention between itself, but in this time. We do not uh, relate the input to itself, but we relate the output of the feedforward network to itself. So it can learn a hierarchy of attention, actually. So in the first, in the in the in the uh, lowest encoder, we learn um, we learn to re relate input words to each other. In the next decoder, we do a second order um, self attention. So we we learn to. Uh, well, we learn to, to map the encodings of the first layer uh, or we learn to connect the encodings of the first layer to, uh, to themselves, right? And we, 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 uh, we do this all along our um, encoder architecture. Good, so that's basically the, uh, the transformer. Uh, as I said, the big advantages are there are no recurrent connections which means there are constant path lengths um, and which also means that parallelization can be done within multiple aspects of the model or multiple um, in multiple layers of the model. Good, further, further ingredients of the transformer which are of minor importance, so like from a high level um, perspective. So first it has multi-headed attention. So it does not only have a single attention head, um, which gives attention between, um, uh, which, which makes self attention on top of a layer, but like it has multiple heads, um, multiple kinds of attentions, which you could also visualize. They are not always easily um, interpretable to humans, but you can imagine you have more attention head, so you can f the model can focus on different aspects uh, with these different uh, attention heads. Another thing, <coughs> another thing is <coughs> that it uses byte pair encoding. What is byte pair encoding? So this is an automatic split up of the input. As you can see here, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired especially you can see it here in tired so it split up this word into two parts um, and this this is important because um, this may avoid out of vocabulary words in the test data so if you have a new test data and you have some input word that you have never seen then if you do not have this uh, such a split up then you, the model may not know what it should do with this new word, but um, maybe there's a meaningful um, a, a meanif meaningful segmentation of that, uh, of that new input that it sees, and each of the parts of that segmentations are known to the model, so the model can gracefully recover from an unknown word, right? So, and this, this is uh, actually, this is a standard trick in all of neural machine translation since the work of Nico Senrich, but is, is a very important one to make the model perform well in, in uh, new test settings. And uh, finally, it also used positional embeddings because the original model does not have any, does not have any information about order. So uh, all it sees is like, a, all it sees is, a, well, kind of a bag of words of inputs and it doesn't know their order, so it also needs to to add an embedding of um, 
uh, of the position, uh, which is important so that the model can in incorporate order. So the, let us now look at two sample applications of the transformer model, uh, of the transformer architecture. The first one is GPT-2. This is a text generation model that was popularized in 2018. Uh, it's a text generation model, therefore it only uses the decoder part of the transformer architecture. Because the transformer architecture is so uh, efficient, GPT-2 could be pre-trained on very large amounts of text. Therefore, it achieved a quality of output that was unprecedented at the time. You can go to that web page and try it out for some fun experiments. Um, I uh, already tried it out. I already so what you can do here is you go to that website, you give in a prompt, and it will continue this prompt. And if you're lucky, you, you can even do uh, some interesting tasks with it, such as machine translation. So I typed that in before, then I clicked on generate. And what you will notice is that it is getting the intention that you are for. So in this case, I'd, I'd, I asked it to translate Ich liebe dich into English. Uh, and it said, OK, I'm lying down. That's not exactly correct, the correct translation, but it's getting your correct intention. Uh, yeah. So try it out for yourself. You'll notice that it is uh, produces highly chromatical text that is often also very semantically coherent. So in this case now, uh, the example was not so good. But, uh, well, if we try long enough, we will get um, we get a couple of good samples in any case. Good. So besides GPT-2, the, uh, the other uh, very popular uh, application of the transformer model is BERT, which we will be discussing next. So when we talk about BERT, we first have to talk about embeddings. What are embeddings? Embeddings are vector representations derived from neural networks. The uh, One of the most popular such model Models came up in 2013, 2014 by the group of Tomasz Mikolov, and uh, uh, this is the so-called Wurtovec model. What a Wurtovec model is doing is uh, it's a neural network architecture that tries for a given input word, it tries to predict the surrounding words. Uh, and in doing so, it feeds the input word through a neural network builds in and in the and then uh, and in doing so builds internal representations of the word and uh, because uh, words that have similar contexts will end up with similar internal representations uh, and having similar contexts is at the same time a definition of having the same meaning uh, what we would expect is that words that indeed are uh, very close in meaning will also obtain very similar vector representations. And what Thomas Mikulov showed was if you do the optimization well enough, good enough, then this is indeed the, the result. Uh, this model has been extremely influential and actually uh, one could say that this started the hype in, L in NLP uh, about deep learning and uh, and uh, artificial neural networks. It was so popular that, of course, there were many extensions proposed. Some of these models, such as dependency-based embeddings, uh, tried to try to adjust the original uh, model by taking more syntax and grammar into account. Then there was fast text in 2017. This is also very popular because it built a, a vector representation that takes the characters in the word into account. And this is useful if you go to other languages which are more complex than English, have more variation in word spelling than English. And also it is useful even in English when, for example, you have typos in words uh, then you can gracefully um, recover from such typos and get a word representation uh, that is still uh, very close 
to the word representation that you would have obtained for the correctly spelled word. Uh, another very popular extension is going multilingual. So you would build vector representations not only for English, but jointly for two, three, four or more languages. So you would have uh, vector representations that have the property that translations uh, of words across languages have similar vector representations. This is useful if you wanna um, if you want to do transfer across languages, assume you have a multilingual vector space, but you have training data only in English, then um, you can train your model with multilingual representations and afterwards apply that model in any other lang language that is covered by your vector space model. So this is a, a really cool and great application. But all of these, uh, but all of these static embeddings had one important drawback: they were static. So what does that mean? Just uh, first, let's look at um, let's look at the um, let's look at uh, some examples of word embeddings. So here we see a typical illustration of word embeddings. Typically, these word embeddings are like several, uh, three, four, five hundred dimensional. We depict them here in a two-dimensional space because. Uh, we cannot um, we cannot show them in three hundred dimensional space. So um, what you immediately see here is that words that are intuitively very similar to each other, such as charge and battery, are indeed close in the vector space or paint and color also close in the vector space. But behold, that each word um, has um, exactly one vector representation, even though this word may probably have multiple senses. Let's take the, the word table here. Uh, this word has um, at least a couple of senses in English where it can mean something like, uh, um, uh, well, something where you put food on, or it could also mean uh, like a, a, a table in mathematics, uh, table three, right? So it has different senses, but it would always have, it would always have the same vector in this model. So, and this obviously um, is a limitation. So, in 2018, a couple of researchers uh, proposed the so-called ELMO model, which revolutionized the word embeddings models by giving each word a different embedding depending on its context in a sentence. Uh, how does ELMO look, look like? Well, ELMO's, first of all, ELMO solves, solves a certain task. Uh, so, this is the ELMO architecture. It is a bidirectional RNN. Uh, so it goes in both directions and it has two layers and um, it solves a certain task and this, this task is called language modeling. So it tries to predict at each time step the next word. So if we're at this time step here, it tries to predict the cat. If we're here, the cat is, it tries to predict happy and if we are, the cat is happy, it tries to predict that this is the end of the sentence. So it, its task is language modeling. Why is that a good task? Well, obviously, if you can predict the future from the past, you have a quite powerful model. Okay, so this is this is a good task. And now, what is Elmo doing? Elmo is using the mm, the internal representations that the RNN is building up. So the RNN has the, has its hidden states in which it builds internal representations, and then it concatenates these internal representations to produce a vector representation for each word in its context. And of course, if the context varies, so if this word happy would appear in a different context, like with different preceding words and different uh, uh, following words, then the internal representations would be different, and therefore the vector representation for happy would also be different. So this was a major improvement over uh, over the static word embeddings model available previously. However, ELMO also had a problem. So first of all, it uses an RNN, and we've already learned that RNNs are not as good as other models. For example, we could replace the RNN by a transformer. Secondly, it's quite a shallow model. It only has two hidden layers. So that's also not good. So, so what was next? Uh, next was BERT. Uh, and BERT was doing exactly what you would expect it to do after having heard the first part of the lecture. 
So BERT, first of all, it replaced uh, the RNA layers by transformer layers, which can be, which are more efficient to train, so you could train BERT on a lot of data. Uh, it uses much deeper networks, which either is 12 or 24 layers. There are two variants of BERT, uh, BERT base and BERT large. It is a deep bidirectional model. Well, ELMO is also bidirectional, but it is not uh, a joint model. Well, ELMO trains two independent uh, um, RNN layers, one going from left to right, the other going from right to left, and then concatenates these representations. In contrast, BERT really trains a joint bidirectional model. And then the major the major distinction of, of BERT over everything that was almost everything that was before was there before in NLP is the following. So previously people were using were uh, using some some task such as uh, in word to vec there was this context prediction task, in Elmo there was this language modeling task and from this task they derived embeddings. Uh, these could either be static or, or contextualized, but they would use, they would take these embeddings, um, they would take these embeddings and, um, and feed them into some, some different architecture and then, uh, and then solve some specific tasks. So they would add these embeddings as features, uh, as input features, to, to any deep learning architecture. Instead, what BERT is doing is it, uh, it, it already proposes a complete architecture and you do not take components out of that architectures and feed them in somewhere else. But you, you take the complete architecture that, has been, that is pre-trained uh, on huge amounts of text, so again due to the efficiency of transformers, uh, the people, the, the authors of BERT pre-trained that on huge amounts of text and then, so in order to find a good solution for the whole BERT architecture, a good initial solution, and then you just fine-tune that good initial solution on your task-specific data. So in a sense BERT has entirely changed the way that deep learning in NLP is conducted. So let's look at BERT in some more detail. So. So here we, you see the two phases of BERT, one is pre-training, the other one is fine-tuning. In pre-training you have the BERT architecture uh, and what you do is you solve two unsupervised tasks. The first one is mask language modeling and the second one is next sentence prediction. So what is mask language modeling doing? Mask language modeling is doing the following. You mask out some word in the input, so you have two, two sentences as, as input. It could be one sentence also, but um, uh, for the sake of the next sentence prediction task, it has to be two sentences. So I as input to BERT comes a sentence, and some tokens are removed from the input, right? So you just don't show the model what these uh, inputs actually are. You set their values to zero. And then what the model has, has to be able to do is it has to predict those missing, uh, these missing uh, tokens, right? And the next sentence prediction task is uh, you want to, to check whether sentence B is a plausible uh, successor of sentence A in, in, a, in, a, in a document or whether sentence B is just a random sentence. So these are two unsupervised task and um, this idea of using some auxiliary task to solve uh, in order to get good uh, representations is not new at all so this was used in Virtuvec, this was also used in Elmo however uh, the difference is as I said that after, after your model has been trained you keep the entire model uh, and you just fine-tune it on any specific task so if your task is question answering, uh, what you do is you keep the entire model with its initial solution of weights and you find you need to solve your task. For example, you would predict something up here uh, or if you have different tasks, you would, uh, you would um, add a different classifier on the output, uh, on the output layer of BERT somewhere uh, and make BERT predict your specific task. But otherwise, you keep the same architecture and you just fine-tune some of the weights in the architecture. 
So this is the, the bird way of doing things. Uh, again, bird was incredibly successful. Um, and because it was successful, again, we see many extensions proposed. Uh, like uh, a couple of months ago, there was Roberta. What they, what they did is uh, they say bird is undertrained, so they trained it for longer on more data and they removed the next sentence prediction task and they claim to show that this uh, again gives much better results than BERT alone. Then there's ALBERT. Uh, what is ALBERT doing? Well, it's scaling BERT down. So BERT is uh, super computationally expensive, um, even though it's using transformers, uh, which can be paralyzed, but still it has very many parameters and it needs to be trained on TPUs, so uh, so not many universities can actually afford that, so it really has to go via Google, etc., Google, Facebook, etc. So what people are now trying to do is to make uh, a bird smaller, and this Albert is one, one um, solution in this direction. Albert sounds for a little bird. Uh, then we also have multilingual bird, uh, this is uh, trained on a concatenation of 104 languages. So you basically take uh, not only English Wikipedia or like English data, but you just uh, concatenate uh, text data from 104 languages and train BERT on that. And what comes out is you have a multilingual model um, in the sense that I've described previously. So what you can do with this model, you train it uh, with English, uh, you, f you you take the pre-trained model, you fine-tune it on English, you fine-tune it on, on English uh, label training data, and afterwards you can apply this model uh, with this specific task that you are uh, intending to solve on, on German, French, Spanish, and many other languages, and many other extensions. Like, if you want to picturize that, then uh, you could say that Elmo was influencing BIRD, and the bird was in uh, 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 well was the, the the ancestor of Roberta and many different variants out there, right? And this is currently an extremely active field of research. As a short interlude, let's briefly, very briefly, talk about B and multilingual embeddings. So in a B and multilingual embedding space, we map words from two languages in the same space so that uh, not only the problem holds that words that are monolingually similar such as man and child or bike and car are close to each other but also cross or cross-lingually similar words such as man and father or trinken and eat are similar in the vector space and of course we cannot only do this for uh, for words but we can also do that for whole sentences. So let's talk about reference-based evaluation with BERT. And the following part of the talk is based on our two papers, um, on, a, on three papers. The first one, which we uh, got accepted last year on EMNLP, Mover Score, and the Thir the second and the third one are recent papers that we got at accepted at ACL 2020 and all three papers deal with uh, evaluation of text generation systems. The first one in the reference based uh, setup and <clears throat> the second and third in the reference free setup and you will see from the presentation what the difference between reference based and reference free is. Uh, yeah. And the difference between the second and the third is the second is on machine translation, the third is on summarization. So what is the traditional approach in evaluation of machine translation, for example? So we have three ingredients. Um, <coughs> we have a metric. Uh, we have our the prediction of a machine translation system. So this could just be a translation of some source text. Um, but the source text is not included here in the in the evaluation uh, framework. But instead of the source text, we have a human reference translation. So imagine we translate from German to English, 
and uh, we would have the correct translation or one of the possible correct and good translations given by a human expert. This is the, refer the human reference translation and we have our system prediction. And then we have a metric where the metric uh, traditionally in natural language processing for the last 20 years has been the plus score or in summarization maybe the rouge score. Now if you were from, uh, NL from if you had an NLP background then you would know what these two score means. Uh, if not, I will uh, illustrate them in the next uh, slide. So let's, let's illustrate with an example. So we have an English source text. Let's say here for the sake of, um, for the sake of illustration, let's say that's a, a poem, a short poem. Uh, and it says, who died two days before and now had found an unknown barren beach for burial ground. Then let's also assume we have a, a German reference translation given by some expert in poetry and also some expert in German, obviously. And maybe that reads like, uh, Vorgestern starben in dieser fand, dieser fand im Bette des Fremden sans die letzte Ruhestätte. And we have our system prediction. In this case, the system was just myself. And I would translate the above English, send, uh, the above English poem as follows. Der vor zwei Tagen starb und nun fand einen unbekannten öden Strand als Grabestritt. So now what you can see, uh, if you, so now in the evaluation framework, we would just compare uh, the prediction of the, of the system to the human reference translation. And if we had a hard metric such as PLU, uh, we would call this a hard metric, it would count the lexical overlap, right? So and in this case, the lexical overlap between Y prime and Y is just one single word. So blue would probably say this is, uh, is not a good translation uh, of this English source text. Uh, and obviously, if you're fluent in English and German, you would say that, uh, well, this translation maybe is not as good as this one here. So this would be up to dispute, but certainly it's also not a very bad translation. So what could we do to, uh, to remedy in this situation? What we could do is we could use soft metrics instead. Uh, and these approaches would, for example, take, uh, 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 make use of word embeddings. So word embeddings are, can be thought of as soft metric. Uh, and uh, we would just replace the hard matching, the counting of the overlap. Uh, we would replace that by the counting of the lexical overlap would be replaced by, well, uh, a metric, uh, um, well, a, uh, a comparison that, that uh, compares word embeddings in both, in both texts, the Y prime and Y. Uh, and if we use word embeddings, then these uh, innately uh, are built in they have a, uh, a notion of similarity, so uh, of soft similarity. So a word may be similar to some, de to some degree to some other word. For example, if we go back, then uh, maybe uh, uh, a word embedding would know that starben and starb, they are quite similar. Um, maybe you would find that Grabestätte and Ruhestätte are also synonyms right and sand and strand are also quite similar so if you use such a soft matching approach you'd probably do a lot better and you could use word embeddings of course you could also use sentence embedding sentence embeddings are just uh, well in a sense they are generalizations of word embeddings that represent whole sentences as vectors uh, and now let's say for the uh, let's say for the for the sake of argument that we're using word embeddings then of course better than static word embeddings like the ones we've seen uh, in one of the earliest slides uh, are contextual word embeddings because they also take context into account, right? So the, we can assume that they are better. Now, uh, how, how can we make uh, a metric using contextual word embeddings? Uh, we could use ELMO of course, and it has been done, but ELMO was not so much of a success. So let, uh, compared to what has come after Elmo, so let's go with Bird because Bird uh, is obviously one of the best 
one of the best uh, contextualized embedders. So how would that go? So I illustrate here with a paper from Zhang et al, Bird Score, which was uh, ac accepted this year, just like a few months ago on iClear 2020. So we have a, uh, let's make an illustration with, with some uh, gold reference text Y prime. The weather is cold today and the system translation is it is freezing today. So we feed this, uh, these two texts, we feed them into BERT. What we get from BERT is uh, we get uh, embeddings for each token. So we have five tokens here, so we get five embeddings here. Where do we get these embeddings from? Remember the BERT architecture, it had these uh, input tokens and then uh, it, it would feed, these input tokens would feed into the architecture and, uh, and BERT has different layers. So for each token, we have a full layer of representations. So we have the first layer, second layer, third layer, etc. Until uh, BERT has overall 12 layers or 24 layers. So on each layer, for each token, we get some representation. And what, they, what you could do is you could take the average representation here or you could just take any arbitrary number. So what we have done, uh, we, we took some average here uh, and I think they only took the last layer, but um, you have different options here. So in any case, for each embed, for each token in the input, we get some embedding. What then they did or what they do is they compute a pairwise cosine similarity. So everything compared with everything that gives such a matrix here. So we have the reference text on one axis and uh, the system prediction on the what other axis and we do a full comparison between all the words. Uh, and now what they do is they go, um, they go along the reference text. And of course you can symmetrize this by exchanging the two, uh, the two texts on the two axes. Uh, but first they, uh, they look at the reference text and they check this row and they check which one has the highest, uh, which, which score is highest. And they say, okay, this score here is highest, so we take this one. They do it for the second row also. Okay, which score is highest? This one is highest. Uh, for the last one today, which is highest? Okay, this one here is highest. So in a, in a sense, for each word in one text, they look for the highest scoring word in the other text. So for the word whose representation has the highest cosine si similarity, right? And in this way, what they obtain is they obtain, obtain a kind of a word level alignment between the two sequences. So in this case, the word the would be aligned with it, freezing would be aligned with cold, and today would be aligned with today. And then they introduce some more scores, but basically, uh, and then they make a full computation. So these, these other weights that they introduce here are not so important for the moment. Uh, and for the for the illustration, the most important is these scores here. Basically, they weight these scores a little bit and sum them up. And by doing so, they get a, a score for the whole uh, for the whole pair of sentences. So, and this score says how similar is this sequence to the other and um, to this other sequence. And intuitively, why this is a a, a good approach to do? Well. The approach says if for each word here we find one other word that has a good that has a high similarity to this word, we find it for all of them, then maybe these two sequences um, are highly similar. Okay, so this is the intuition. Okay, what we did instead we proposed to compare two sets of contextualized embeddings with so-called earth mover distance. Earth mover distance, that's a, a, a metric or a measure between two probability distribution that has been introduced in 2017. It measures the amount of work to be done to transform one distribution into another. And we, we, we combine earth mover distance uh, with bird embeddings in our paper mover score. Now, uh, let's <clears throat> very informally look at earth mover distance. So the earth mover distance between two distributions is proportional to the minimum amount of work required to convert one distribution into the other. And the cost of moving the dirt, so one distribution is considered as dirt and the other one is co uh, 
considered as whole holes and uh, and then the the metaphor that is being used is the cost of moving the dirt depends on the weight of the dirt so how big is that dirt and the distance it has to cover so how far has the, does this dirt have to travel and uh, well a, a, a visual uh, uh, characterization of that process is given below here so here you see the dirt uh, and the dirt well it splits up and then it moves into the holes right and the, the bigger the chunks are of dirt and the further they have to travel, the higher the cost. So this is just a very uh, visual, metaphorical uh, description of earth mover distance. I'm not going into any mathematical details. If you want, um, if you want to look that up, uh, I'm happy to give you uh, references. Or, I mean, below here is also, again, a very nice and... Uh, easygoing uh, discussion of earth mover distance. So now what we do is uh, we have for our for our score mover score we have the reference y prime we have the the system prediction y we feed that into bird we get the embeddings out uh, we compute pairwise Euclidean distance so that's not a big difference you could use pairwise Euclidean distance or pair, pairwise cosine similarity from that we get a, dif a distance matrix and then from the earth mover <coughs> From Earth Mover, we get the transportation costs. How much, how costly is is it um, to uh, transform one sequence into the other sequence? And this this is given by an optimization problem. You you plug it into some algorithm. Out comes this matrix here, and uh, and uh, yeah. And then what we do is. We, we take a pairwise, uh, pairwise product of these two matrices or a, a pointwise product of these two matrices. I think that's also called Hadamard product. So we just multiply everything and then sum it up. And then we get the mover score. Okay, so that is our approach. So to, on, a, on a high level, what is the difference between both approaches? Well, bird score uses this heuristic or greedy alignment so that, that we saw this was kind of... <clears throat> for each word trying to to capture the most similar word in the other sequence uh, this can be can be thought of as a greedy alignment whereas mover score computes an optimal alignment by solving an optimization problem so that's that is the the difference and if we look at results so here what what do we have we have german to english translation and chinese to english translation in a paper we have many more but just for illustration i show these two uh, what we do now is we have our systems. Uh, we have like for German to English, we have, uh, let's say we have thousand sentences, thousand German sentences. Uh, in each case, we have an English gold standard human reference. Uh, we have some system predictions. Uh, and we, in addition, we have uh, human scores that for each uh, for each system prediction and each reference tells us how good uh, the, s the system prediction is, right? So we have also these human scores. And then what we do is we, uh, we measure the goodness of the systems by blue. Uh, and yeah, by, by the blue score, by the meteor score, by ruse, by bird score, mover score, and two versions of mover score. And then we correlate the scores that these metrics gives to the human scores right so we make correlation how similar are the uh, how similar are the human scores to the to the automatic metric scores and we find that blue well it's it's in, in english german it's 50 50 percent uh english chinese a little bit higher but o overall that's like medium correlation, right? And then there were a couple of other metrics proposed, especially this one here, Ruse. This is a supervised metric, so it's optimizing on on the human score. So of course that will work much better. So it uh, goes above 60% and close to 70% for Chinese. But the problem with supervised metrics is they usually don't work very well out of domain. And also they are costly, they, they are costly to obtain because they, they need these human scores. Uh, so then comes bird score with bird score with the with the greedy, greedy alignment technique, but it's unsupervised, it improves well, quite consistently on the supervised metric and a lot on blue. 
And we, if we substitute the greedy alignment with the uh, optimal alignment, we improve upon bird score. And then you see also if we compute the optimal alignment, but uh, uh, use word to vec, so the static embeddings instead of word, uh, instead of bird, then we decrease quite considerably and we go back to the level of blue. Good. Now, uh, which extensions could we consider? Um, so the extension extension to consider is uh, most metrics today still use human references Y prime. So also we in this paper used Y prime. But Y prime is costly obtained because some human has to provide it. And secondly, the evaluation is limited to the parallel data available. So if we have a thousand uh, human references uh, written, we can only evaluate our machine translation system on these thousand references. We cannot evaluate it it on anything else. So the evaluation is limited to the parallel data available. So our question is, can we get rid of the human references Y prime and instead only use XY for evaluating text generation, where X is the source sentence and Y is the system prediction. So we don't want to use any gold label provided by human. Is that feasible? And this is the question of reference-free evaluation with BERT that we have addressed in our last two papers. And here you also notice what is the difference between reference-based and reference-free. In reference-free, we do not have human references. In reference-based, we have human references. So how could we do text generation evaluation without human, without human references? So the first possible approach is we uh, as directly assess the quality or similarity of X and Y prime. Well, if there, maybe there are tools available that allow us to do so. And the second option is uh, we create pseudo references. We, we create somehow a artificial, a fake pseudo reference that does not use humans. And then we have Y double prime, the, the pseudo reference, and we also have the system prediction and we compare these. So we go back to the original case and compare, compare these two here. Right? So how can we directly assess the quality of X, Y? So in machine translation, we can go to a cross-lingual space. And there are a couple of uh, uh, cross-lingual spaces out there. Uh, cross-lingual space is, for example, laser, multilingual bird, X use. And what are these cross-lingual spaces? These uh, cross-lingual spaces um, are given by um, uh, vectors that lie in a shared space across different languages. So the idea is uh, that you have um, that you have. Let me check if I find an example. Okay. Let's check for an example on the internet. Um, so let's look at this one here. So this is not a good example. Uh, let's look at this one here. Well, that's not so bad. So basically, this is uh, this is English and the other language. I don't know. It could be Italian. Let's say it's maybe Italian. Uh, and you see that uh, that words that are cross-lingually similar, they are close together, like Sweden and Suecia, the uh, probably Italian form of Sweden. Uh, and we would we would have such con properties everywhere in the space. So uh, words or sentences that are uh, cross-lingually similar would be close in the vector space besides the other conditions that words that are similar in one language are also close in the cross-lingual space. Okay, there are a couple, couple of such spaces out there, laser, multilingual bird, X use. In summarization, we could do the same. Uh, we could directly assess that, but now we have enormous length differences. So. You, summarization is the problem of making a short text out of a very long text and the short text summarizes the long text and uh, and usually you can assume that the long text uh, well maybe uh, thousands of words long while the ref the imagine a paper 
which is like nine pages long and the abstract is only like uh, 10 lines, right? So how can we create pseudo-references uh, in machine translation? Well, we could use Google Translate, their other technique, unsupervised neural machine translation. In summarization, what could we do? We could keep the important sentences in the source documents, right? We keep important sentences. So we need to have a measure of importance and we would drop all the other sentences. Now let's, let's look at the results. Um, for summarization, uh, we have, uh, I, we have a similar situation before. Again, we correlate with humans. On the x-axis, we have different metrics. So this is TF-IDF is a very simple metric. Just uh, counts the word overlap, like similar to to uh, to blue. Um, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, but, but weights the word somehow with their term frequency and inverse document frequency. So this is a very simple baseline. Then we have rouge, which is um, um, which is a classical metric for evaluation in in uh, summarization has a similar uh, a similar definition as blue. In this case here, it's a lot better. It's a lot better, and it's a lot better because uh, it works on in the in the in the nice situation of y prime and y, right? Well, this initial score here compares x and y prime, so that is a much harder task. So you see uh, quite quite a large improvement here. Uh, if we compute the mover score uh, between y prime and y, y uh, then we improve upon rouge, not so much as in machine translation, but still we improve upon that. Uh, then what we can do is, um, well, we can uh, Im embed sentences, sen the source sentence and the target sentence with some sentence embedding and compute the cosine similarity uh, and uh, again, this is in the XY situation, and you see we're not doing very well. Uh, we're not even doing better than TF-IDF. If we instead use a mover, uh, mover score plus a fine-tuned bird, uh, we, we improve upon that quite, quite, uh, with quite a nice gap. And then finally, if we compute our pseudo-references by only keeping the important sentences, we still we still uh, get a nice improvement and we beat the previous state of the art. So actually this one actually was the previous state of the art and we improved that quite, quite uh, substantially. But you also notice that we are quite far away from the, the situation Y prime Y. However, we have saved a lot because we did not have to write uh, summaries by humans, which is a very costly task in summarization because humans have to read the whole lengthy text to write a, a short snippet that summarizes that. So our results are considerably worse. However, uh, we have saved a lot of costs. Now we go to machine translation. Here we have blue. We have the mover score. Uh, mover score is much better than blue. Now this is an average over several language pairs. Uh, we use laser. That's that's a cross-lingual sentence embedding techniques uh, technique and we compare the source sentence embedded with the target sentence embedded and apply the cosine uh, similarity so this is a lot worse than blue or this is consider considerably worse than blue if we use multilingual bird and mover score we are even worse than that now why why is that the case now i didn't explain too much about multilingual bird but multilingual bird is just a bird variant that is trained on the concatenation of 100 languages so these people they just concatenated the wikipedia of 100 languages trained bird on that and you can imagine so this worked actually quite well and there are a couple of papers who say well this this is surprisingly good uh, a surprisingly good approach but on the other hand you can imagine that this does have some problems. I mean, some uh, immediate problems that arise is if two word, if two languages have a similar word, uh, have the same form of a word, let's say gift in German and English. So the model cannot differentiate at all between these two forms. So it just sees gift uh, twice in the data, so to speak, one in the English part and one in the German part, and it has to deal with that. 
So obviously you can imagine that this leads to some problems. So w we believe that this is the reason why uh, move it, uh, multilingual bird is here not good. So we do, uh, we, we introduce a remapping technique. So um, we remap this whole multilingual space uh, and we, we improve upon that uh, and, and then we get quite nice improvements. And finally, if we use a target side language model, uh, um, then, and this language model, uh, well, a language model is, is a model that accounts for the goodness of a sentence in a language. If we add that to the, to the remapping, then finally we get a metric that is consistently better than plu and uses no, uh, uses no, um, um, references so it's quite cheap to get uses no references it's better than blue that actually is is a cool metric good now we go one step further and we want to investigate these cross-lingual representations um, and how do we investigate these cross-lingual representations so we do something that we w that we call here fooling um, and we, we consider three kinds of foolings. The first one is we randomly shuffle Y prime. So this Y prime is the, the human reference machine translation. Uh, we reorder Y prime to match the word order of the input sentence, X. And we, we take X prime and we do an expert word by word translation. So how do, do these things look like? So we take an example here. Um, uh, the example is, uh, dieser von Langsamkeit geprägte Lebensstil scheint aber ein Patentrezept für ein hohes Alter zu sein. So this is the original German source sentence. The, referen the, uh, the English reference translation given by an expert in English and German uh, wrote, however, this slow pace of life seems to be the key to a long life. Good. So the random reordering is just we randomly shuffle this text uh in 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 some word order uh the ex the expert reordered why prime is um this slow pace of life life seems however the key to a long life to be what you see is the however goes in the middle from the start to the middle because the aber is also in the middle in german and you also see the typical uh german uh, uh ending the German case of, of the verb ending the sentence. So, zu sein, which was uh, somewhere in, in the middle here, goes to the very end. And then if we do a word by word translation, uh, so we will get this of slow pace, characterized lifestyle, etc. etc. So this is a very Germanish English sentence. This of slow pace, characterized lifestyle, seems however a patent recipe. For a high age to be. Now we what we so this these are our foolings. Now we want to check what do our metrics do. So our, as our metrics we have laser, which I didn't actually introduce here. So therefore I skip laser. Uh, I just go to multilingual bird. So now we check the preferences of multilingual bird. So we for each such sentence uh, we check which score does bird give to x and y prime. So remember, X is the uh, source sentence, Y prime is the human gold standard reference. Y prime random is just a random reordering of Y prime. So we get a score here. This is a number, this is a number. We subtract these two numbers. So something comes out. If this number is positive, then multilingual bird prefers X, prefers Y prime rand over Y prime because the X is fixed. If this number is negative, it prefers x, y prime, right? And here's a histogram. So this is the score difference. Here's a histogram over the score difference. You see the values. There are some positive values, but most of them are ne negative. So this means multilingual bird prefers x, prefers y prime over y prime ram, rand. And this is a good thing because this shows that multilingual bird uh, is not a bag of words model. It can differentiate between good word order, correct English word order, and random English word order. Now let us look at the expert reorder. So this was the case where we had Germanized, uh, the Germanized uh, version of 
of English, but only taking the words that are available through Y prime. What we see here now is, um, well, we see here now that the, the score difference is actually centered around zero, right? So bird is mostly indifferent between Y prime and Y prime reordered, okay? If we go to the word by word translation, then we see a clear picture. Well, the centering is clearly positive. A, a multilingual bird prefers the human word by word translation over the, the actual, so this was a very Germanized English, over actual English. So what does that mean overall? That means overall, uh, what we have found out by our three experiments, first experiment showed a uh, multilingual bird cares about word order. If you put in a random word order, that's not good. So this is a good thing for the metric. Second experiment showed um, it, is, it is indifferent between having uh, a correct English word order and having a uh, the case where the word order of the source and the target are the same because this is actually the reordering makes the word order of of input of source and and target identical right so it says if the word order is either correct word order or the word order is the same as the input sentences i'm indifferent between these cases and therefore because here the word order is good, it has the same word order as correct English, but the lexical overlap is higher. So we have a higher lexical overlap, because you can check here that, uh, well, each word is a literal translation, more or less. It's not exactly literal, because it also keeps the word senses. That's why it's done by an expert. Each word is a, is a, good, tran literal, a good literal translation of the input, so we have a good semantic match and we also have syntactically a good situation, right? Good, so this, uh, this concludes uh, this part, uh, this concludes the talk. So we see rapid advances due to evaluation metrics being based on BERT. So we have seen we can do much, much better nowadays. However, in the reference-free context, there's still a considerable gap and we have shown that the bird that is trained on multilingual data has quite severe deficits. Um, and namely, it's not a bag of words model, that's good, but it's ind indifferent between correct word order and source language word order, meaning source and target have the same word order. And these, um, the current cross-lingual multilingual embeddings, they like uh, translation ease. Uh, they like translationese very much uh, because translationese has a good word ordering and it has, it's also semantically good. However, this is a severe problem for ev machine translation evaluation because that is what many machine translation systems are producing, translationese. This is exactly like word-by-word -word translations. That's what they are producing. And these cross-lingual metrics believe that this is a good thing to do. Well, actually, we... Um, intuitively think this is, is not a good thing to do, right? Um, we don't like to have word-by-word -word translations to other languages. And the current multilingual me metrics, even those based on BERT, are not capable of uh, correctly dealing with translation ease, and they are not capable of taking, of, of, um, of judging language at such a fine-grained level. So thanks a lot. If you are interested, come to our workshop, Evaluation of NLP Systems, uh, also called Eval for NLP, at EMNLP 2020 in Punta Cana. And, and now it's actually online due to Corona. And if you want to try out Mover Score, uh, check out this here, and we'll provide new scores for, the ref for, for our recent accepted papers uh, in the cross-lingual case. Thanks a lot.